So hello everyone. This is again your student talks. Uh, I am uh, still Marlene. Uh, and uh, today we will be talking about students in France, especially about their housing conditions, psychological distress and academic success during the first COVID-19 lockdown. And uh, we have invited here three wonderful researchers from France, Odile Perry, uh, Elise Tonore, and Alexis Alamel. So hello, uh, nice to have you here. And before uh, I will give the word to you, I will very briefly introduce uh, you as our speakers uh, to our listeners today. So first of all, um, Alexis Alamel, PhD, is an associate professor in geography at Sciences Po Rennes, University of Rennes. Uh, his research interests focus on student residential choices, their living conditions, the unfolding of studentification processes, uh, especially in the UK and in France, as well as students' domestic energy practices and behaviors in light of fuel poverty situations. Uh, his latest works have explored the academic mobility of associate geography professors in France. And currently, Alexis is uh, examining the spatial and professional trajectories of PhD holders in France. Our second speaker, Odile, is head of uh, studies at the Observatory of Student Life. Uh, she is in particular in charge of the participation of France in the Eurostudent project and uh, she is one of the country representatives in the steering board of your student. She has been involved in different research projects regarding students' living conditions and has a particular interest for survey methodology. And last but not least, uh, we have here Elise Tanneré, PhD, who is an associate professor in sociology at Paris uh, Dauphine University, PSL. Her research interests focus on students' living conditions, selection processes, and social inequality in education. Her latest works have explored selection tools in higher education, as well as students' jobs transformations due to digital employment platforms. Elise is currently conducting research on the channeling processes of Ivorian students' international mobility. So uh, greetings to you once again. Uh, we are very happy to have you here, and uh, I won't make my intro any longer. The floor is yours for the presentation. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Thank you very much, um, Marlene and um, everyone. We are really happy to be able to present our paper um, in this webinar. Um, we um, are going to present um, an article recently published in the European Journal of Higher Education. Um, the title of the presentation is uh, exactly the title of the, this article. Um, this article will focus on the, in our presentation, um, is focused on the impact of accommodation um, on students' psychological distress and academic success. So, and um, we use um, specific details, specific information regarding the accommodation uh, to measure, um, uh, to analyze its impact on students. Um, the, our presentation will start with presenting the context uh, our research took place in the research question and theoretical background um, we used, uh, uh, our hypothesis and the methodology. And then we'll start with presenting our results. Um, first, uh, how the housing situation of students in France uh, um, um, changed or not during the first lockdown, and then the effect uh, the housing situation had on students' psychological distress and their academic success. Okay, so in terms of context, and I think it's very important to, to mention, um, Elise, Odile, and I, we presented separately uh, about three years ago, or two years ago, sorry, uh, during the Eurostudents uh, 7 final conference. 
And uh, this was a great opportunity and platform for us to meet and to discuss our respective work. And since then, we have merged our data and research, and we have uh, decided to publish uh, this uh, article. Uh, I also take this chance to uh, thank uh, Christina and uh, Marcus Lertz, who have done a fantastic job in uh, guiding us uh, toward the the publication process and as well the feedback, the very crucial feedback they gave us uh, for this paper. So thank you very much to both of them. So this brings us back to uh, three years ago. Uh, we are on uh, March 12th and uh, the French president Emmanuel Macron announces on TV that uh, universities and higher education institutions will be shut down for about two weeks uh, regarding uh, the limitation of the spread of the COVID-19 that uh, arrived in Europe during that time. Five days, four days later, on March 16th, uh, uh, President Macron had a uh, public speech on TV and said that uh, we are at war and is asking uh, French people uh, to stay home and that a lockdown will be reinforced uh, 24 hours later, which means that students had 24 hours to decide where they will be for the next two weeks which was initially a knockdown for two weeks, lasted uh, from mid-March and almost to mid-May. And it was a very strict lockdown. Uh, you can see on this slide the different uh, newspapers, uh, front page, uh, telling us the emergency of the situation. Uh, it's also important in this context uh, to discuss about the student experiences, of course, of the classes were taught online for many of them, study practices and people's mental health were strongly impacted uh, during that time, especially during this first lockdown. Friends had uh, a total of three lockdown. And of course, we wanted to look at the housing environment, uh, which became a very crucial uh, element for understanding uh, the living conditions of students, as well as their success and their perseverance in studies and see if there were uh, any orientation after the first lockdown. Suivant. So these uh, different, uh, this context and these different elements led us to three main research questions. So the first question was wondering if there was a direct impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on students' living situation. Uh, the second point we address in this paper and we're going to address with you today, what is the relationship between housing and distress, uh, expecting adverse living conditions, leading to uh, more distress among students' population. And the third uh, question, what is the relationship between housing and academic performance and orientation? Are we expecting a partial mediation through distress? So to answer these questions, we adopted this theoretical model, which is in the following figure, uh, and developed four hypotheses concerning the expected link between housing situation, psychological distress, and academic su success, and as well, the overall effect of uh, the lockdown on housing situation. So I will develop these hypotheses in the next slide. So the first hypothesis is that the lockdown has had an impact on housing situation, though there have been changes in living situation due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Second hypothesis is that we expect there is a link between housing situation and psychological distress. Especially, we expect students in student accommodation to face a higher level of psychological distress. Our third hypothesis is that we expect a link between psychological distress and academic success. So students with psychological distress, we expect they have a lower level of study success compared to other students. And our four, fourth hypothesis is that there is a link between housing situation and academic success, partly mediated through psychological distress and partly significant uh, and uh, remaining even after controlling for um, socioeconomic characteristics and psychological distress. So we draw these hypotheses from the literature. Um, there, is, there are articles concerning the link between housing situation uh, and uh, psychological distress. 
accommodation plays uh, a critical part in students' transition towards adulthood. It's a primary source of expenditure for students. And living home is primarily motivated by the physical distance between the place of study and the location of the parental home. So we expect accommodations, characteristics, morphology and arrangements to have an effect on psychological distress. This is drawn from the literature because there has proven to be an effect, um, a link between accommodation characteristics and students' housing situation, and also a link between accommodation characteristics and mental health. For example, in Morvan and Al, uh, we find, uh, they find that uh, students who live alone have a higher probability to declare mental health issue. And in a comparative study, more recent, of 2021, uh, there has proven to be a significant effect of a change in family contact on depressive symptoms. There is also literature concerning the um, housing situation and study success, uh, which um, can be declined in two dimensions. There would be first an effect of material living conditions for example, from um, mainly work done in France, there is a positive effect of having a private room on academic success for students, and also an effect of a good internet connection or having a personal computer. But also housing situation can have an, can have an effect through the social environment it brings. There is an ambivalent effect of living with parents because uh, students have better living conditions when they are with their family, generally. But there is also the missing out, th missing out thesis from Holdsworth, which say that students living with parents can be less, have a lower degree of integration uh, in their studies. There are also work showing a positive effect of a shared student kitchen in a residence, for example. But of course, context matters. For example, the uh, particular situation of students' accommodation in France uh, we can expect that there is a, a negative effect of students' residents, especially in France, contrary uh, to what uh, can be found, uh, for example, in the United Kingdom. And the third uh, literature is concerning psychological distress and study success. We uh, expect um, with this literature a negative correlation between stress level and academic performance, for example, from an OECD uh, study and also a negative correlation between depression, mental disorders, and academic performance. On the contrary, we expect from the literature a positive correlation between um, stress levels and risks of dropping out and mental disorders and risks of dropping out. Odile, je te passe la parole. Uh, yeah, sorry. Um, we are going to introduce briefly the methodology we used um, in um, our analysis, our research. Um, we used uh, both quantitative and qualitative, uh, quantitative and qualitative data uh, collected simu simu simultaneously uh, before analyzing it. Um, first, we use uh, we will present the quantitative data collected. Uh, France has a long history of collecting data on students' living conditions through um, uh, its uh, main survey every three years. Um, the um, last edition happened during the lockdown. It started um, on the same day as the higher education institutions uh, were closed uh, by the government. Uh, due to the spread of COVID-19. Um, nevertheless, the survey could happen. We um, adapted the questions to make sure that students would respond for their normal previous situation uh, as before the lockdown started. We collected in this survey uh, more than 60,000 answers from the students. Um, and um, with the length of the lockdown that we could not expect in the beginning, we felt the need for um, new data uh, as soon as the lockdowns uh, finished. Uh, and we um, asked uh, the same students that uh, had responded to our main survey to respond to the follow-up survey, a very short follow-up survey uh, that focused on the main um, 
aspects of life that we uh, felt had been affected by the pandemic and the lockdown, uh, such as accommodation, of course, but also the um, resources, the uh, studying condition, and so on. And in this survey, um, 6,130 uh, students responded completely to a questionnaire. And uh, we use both surveys to, um, uh, in the, the research we, uh, we led. All right, so now onto the qualitative data um, process. Um, Initially, there was another research I was conducting uh, at that time um, that was aiming to analyze this uh, student's energy consumption in uh, cruise accommodation. So cruise are uh, social student housing in France. They are the main uh, social housing providers. Uh, but of course, the lockdown happened and the pandemic happened. And uh, so um, I was able to kind of switch the focus of this research and uh, look into students' living conditions during the lockdown. Um, going through semi-structured interviews, 33 uh, students uh, were uh, interviewed. The only conditions was they started the academic year living in this social student housing. And these interviews allowed us to... Um, uh, deepen our understanding of students' uh, individual experiences of the lockdowns. So that was a very uh, strong asset uh, on top of the tremendous amount of quite quantitative data collected. So, so these three interviews uh, among students uh, living in the north of France, so the North Pas de Calais region, for those who know a bit France at the Belgian border. Uh, 19 female and 14 males uh, responded to the uh, uh, were agreed to uh, to participate in the in the interviews. The average age of the uh, interviewees was 24 years old, and over about half of the students were between 20 and 24 years old. Uh, in average, 42 percent were undergraduate students, and 48 percent were master students. The rest uh, of the students being uh, PhD candidates, and uh, over half of the students interviewed uh, were uh, French students and uh, the remaining 45 were international students coming either from North Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa or Europe. So I think it's very important to address how the French population in terms of housing situation was uh, before the lockdown started. Uh, also very point to be made is that uh, French student population is uh, one of the youngest in the Euro student uh, countries. 86% of the students in France are under 25 years old, usually after high school students enter uh, directly higher education institutions. Uh, it's 64 percent in Euro students uh, cross country average. We also observe on this table that about 27 to uh, 33 percent of students in France live with their parents. Uh, 26 percent of students uh, live alone. It's uh, in average 10 percent in the Euro student countries. Uh, we also observe that uh, the general satisfaction degree with accommodation is higher for students living with their parents, uh, much higher than students, for instance, living in student accommodation, uh, though especially the ones um, uh, where the research was conducted are not generally in, in the great conditions. So this could also impact potentially we will see the mental health uh, and uh, we'll then discuss the different changes and the motives uh, for changing accommodation during the lockdown. So about 44% of students uh, left their usual accommodation when the first lockdown period occurred. Uh, remember, as I said in introduction, in the context that uh, students had about 24 hours to decide where they will spend the lockdown. Some students were able to leave after those 24 hours under specific uh, circumstances. Uh, Nearly 77% of the students who decided to leave their usual accommodation uh, went back to at least one of their parents. And I think it's important to quote uh, this uh, verbatim from the interview. 
Well, just because my family is there, so I didn't really want to be alone in a small flat, in a small space. It's not the same to live in a house as to a small hall of residence. I think that it, that I live better at home, for instance, I can just go out in my garden or whatever, whereas in the hall of residence, there wasn't that possibility. So one of the motives for students to go back to their parents was the proximity of the parents' uh, residence location, as well as the comfort and the greater space they could enjoy while being back at their parents. Of course, for international students, it was uh, sometimes very difficult to do that transition and to switch accommodation before the lockdown. And one of the main reasons is that uh, some of the students couldn't go back to their country because some of the flights were canceled, or also in terms of financial reasons, as well as some of the uh, countries, the host countries, the uh, COVID-19 pandemic was uh, situation was worse than it was in France. Uh, but surprisingly, some students decide to stay uh, on purpose in their term time accommodation. So in the social student housing, uh, it was about 53% in the quantitative survey, and it was also uh, shown and stressed in the qualitative survey. For instance, some students didn't want to change their uh, study habits. It was uh, particularly uh, notable, noticeable for uh, PhD students. For instance, it's the case of Fabian, who said, I really stayed to make good progress on my doctoral thesis, to be in a setting where I can be 100% focused without being with my family, without having to change my work habits. Um, of course, among some other students interviewed, there was the, the fear of uh, bringing bad the COVID-19 uh, virus to their parents. At the time, we didn't have too much information about the transmission and contagion degree. Uh, some students decide uh, not to go back in order to uh, protect their family. It's the case for Ode, who said, above all, I was a little bit afraid of bringing the coronavirus home to my parents if I were a healthy carrier or something like that. Uh, also, what was shown during these interviews is that not all students have good relationships with their parents, and in some cases, it was very difficult for some of students to imagine spending uh, at least the initial two weeks of lockdown, but again, that lasted uh, two and a half months, to be with a family. And it's the case for Justin, who said, I don't get on well enough with my family to be in lockdown with them. Yeah, I could have joined. My parents are divorced, but I could have gone with one of them, but no. I'd rather stay in one square meter than like stay with them for two months. So this really showed that some students, it was not necessarily an option to go back to their family due to a uh, poor relationship with them. So 58% of all students spend the lockdown uh, with their parents or at least with uh, one of them. If we look about a third of the survey respondents went back living with their parents whereas 25, 27% were already living with their parents. Uh, some of the students as well um, were stayed alone. So we observed like 13% of students uh, stayed alone, but not necessarily in a student accommodation. And in the focus of the qualitative data in a student accommodation, we can see that 4% of the students stayed. So this means that this um, student social uh, halls of residence were pretty empty during the lockdown. And uh, as uh, shown in the previous uh, quotes from the students interviewed, some of them did it voluntarily, but others were forced to stay. Now, if we look at the um, students' characteristic, I, I think it's still me, right? Yeah. OK, uh, if we look at the students characteristics according to a housing uh, situation during lockdown, what we can see is that um, the share of students that went back to their parents is higher among female students, for instance, and particularly younger female students. We also observe that students living alone uh, were mostly uh, male students at that time. Uh, of course, uh, you can notice in the share of foreign students, 50% stayed in the student accommodation, which reinforced uh, some of the quotes from the interviews. And as well, some students decided to, uh, to stay living with friends and other relatives during that time. Suivant. Yeah. <laughs> so you can, yeah.
And now onto uh, housing situation and living connection during the lockdown. And I think we have some circles around key numbers, maybe. Maybe not. Uh, yes, perfect. Thank you, Adil. Uh, so as you can see in the circle numbers, um, some of the um, the importance of having a decent place of study and uh, calm and separate as well. So not necessarily in the in the re regular uh, student accommodation with a kitchen and a bathroom, nearly all in one in one room. But having a, a study place, a calm and separate, was very important uh, for students who uh, were went back to study with their parents. And if you observe on the first column as well, the uh, degree of uh, dissatisfaction with uh, housing conditions was much higher for students who stayed in uh, halls of residence. Um, and so uh, to as a transition, um, you can see that students who stay in their hall of residence uh, really have stressed uh, the worsening of the living conditions due to the circumstances. Of course, the strict lockdown was uh, very tough uh, for um, most French populations, but uh, we were only allowed to go out for one hour a day at that time with specific papers we had to carry. Uh, but for halls of residence, where the amount of students who stayed was very limited, uh, it became very complicated, the lack of social interaction. And I think uh, Ocean's quote is very revealing of how students felt uh, during that time. It's mostly depressing because I only have one room. In my opinion, if I had a living room, a kitchen, I think it would be bearable. But I admit that the fact of having only one room, well, the very first day I didn't turn the TV on, I didn't put on any music, and also my walls, they are so white. So at the end of the day, I couldn't take it anymore. I couldn't take the room anymore. I couldn't take the whiteness. We will describe now more the, um, um, how we measured the psychological distress of students, uh, the different symptoms they expressed in the quantitative data in the, uh, in the survey run during the, the lockdown. Um, we used a scale, which is the mental health inventory uh, in five items. Um, it's one of the mental health subscales of the short form 36. And the um, version we used was validated. Uh, the French uh, translation was validated uh, in previous research. Um, these, um, uh, this scale showed that 31% of all students presented signs of psychological distress during the first lockdown, almost a third of students. Um, also, uh, for students in a student accommodation, this uh, share rose to 41%. Um, it was also 36% for those who spend the lockdown alone, but as we said, not in a student accommodation, in a, um, uh, a different uh, type of accommodation, but alone. And it was, could I say, only 27% uh, for those who spend the lockdown with their parents. Um, also, we can mention that 81% um, so of the students who stayed in student accommodation suffered from loneliness, um, which, of course, uh, echoes to what uh, Alexis presented uh, as the, the halls of residence had emptied themselves during this time. Um, we can also illustrate uh, the, the feeling that was shared by many students who stayed in student uh, accommodation in halls of residence during this time. Um, the, the first quote um, um, shows the, the difficulties the students uh, felt at this time. Um, mentally, I can say that I'm affected in the sense that I spend all my time reading. Also, I feel the length of the day too much as I cannot physically interact with anyone. Um, this um, uh, feeling was exposed in many uh, interviews uh, during the survey. Uh, also, another quote um, uh, illustrates that many problems that uh, 
were already there were could be exacerbated uh, by the situation. As uh, Agathe says, um, uh, I have had health issues for a while, but my mental and physical health got better until, well, the lockdown started, and then it was declining. I have to be hospitalized, uh, but after another hospitalization, I won't be able to work. I don't even know how I'm going to feed myself, how I'm going to pay the rent and everything else because I'm not going to be able to work this summer because I'm going to be in a hospital. It's, it shows a really dramatic situation for one student, but um, maybe um, hiding some others. Um, these um, um, indicators were used also in a linear regression to confirm that the effect was um, not due to other factors that we um, could um, control here. So we can see that um, uh, in this model, so the scale is used as a linear regression model, um, is used as a scale itself. Um, we can see that uh, students who went back living with, uh, with their parents uh, had significantly less risk of uh, showing psychological distress. Uh, there's a um, and this remained uh, even when we used the uh, information about the internet connection of the students and uh, if they whether they or not they had a com study space um, to use them. and we also controlled um, with sex nationality age uh, the parents social class and also the financial difficulties the students could express. So on, the, on this last part of um, the presentation, we will analyze the effects of housing situation on academic performance and study orientations. Uh, so what are the main effects to start on the, of the lockdown on orientation of, and academic performance? Um, there are big effect, huge effects. We can see that one fourth of students have changed their academic orientation due to the lockdown. 27% of students believe the lockdown period will have a negative impact on their academic results. 38% uh, of internships were cancelled and 72% of international mobility projects have been cancelled due uh, to the lockdown. Um, on the next slide, we can see that this impact is according to a housing situation during the lockdown. So, for example, uh, concerning the direct validation of academic year, um, maybe, Odile, if you click, there will be the circles. Thank you. <laughs> uh, you can see that um, students in uh, student accommodation have a lower probability of validating directly the year. This is 65%, which can be compared to the 81% for the overall sample. Uh, on the perceived negative effect of the lockdown on academic results, we can see that they have these students in academic, um, in student accommodation have a higher probability to perceive negative effects of the lockdown, 38% compared to 27%. And also on the rest of their studies, 63% con compared to 50%. And uh, concerning orientation plans, uh, we compared uh, the intention to drop out, the change of project, orientation project, and the no change for students. And we can look at the uh, change of project, for example, and students in uh, student accommodation have a higher probability to have changed their orientation projects, 41% compared to 19%, um, which uh, is, uh, these probability is much lower for students who were still living with their parents or uh, came back living with their parents. And, and in the final model, uh, we uh, ran regression models, uh, logistic, um, binomial and multinomial for the first, first and the second model, to see if there is a significant effect of housing situation, even after controlling with psychological distress uh, score, with the, condi the housing conditions and also uh, variables which are not presented here, 
control variables, sex, nationality, age, parental, social class, and financial difficulties. And um, Odile, can you please um, click? <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh, we can see the main results here on the, uh, with the circles. If we, uh, we look first at the first model, uh, there are not circles everywhere, so sorry. Uh, we can uh, watch at the effects of uh, these variables on the validation of academic year. Uh, so uh, these are odds ratios uh, which are presented here. So psychological distress store uh, lowers the probability of validating academic year because it's uh, impaired uh, to one. Uh, on the contrary, uh, students who were back living with their parents have a, a higher probability to validate directly their year compared to students who stayed alone. And we can see also that there is a significant Im impact of housing condition, especially having a calm study place, which has had, um, uh, which lowers the probability when uh, the students had done this uh, calm study space. If we look at the second model, uh, the reference is uh, students who didn't change their orientation plan. And we can see that, um, again, the psychological distress score has a significant impact. It increases the changes, the probability to change orientation projects and increases the probability for students to drop out. Um, if we look at the housing situation, uh, you can see that uh, students who went back living with their parents have a, a lower probability to change their orientation projects or to drop out, whereas students in a student accommodation, who remained in their student accommodation, have a higher probability to change their orientation projects. Um, and, uh, and also there is a positive effect of internet connection and uh, calm study space. You can see that when the internet connection is poor and where, when students didn't have this calm study space, they have a higher probability to change their orientation projects. So now we will try to sum up uh, these results in um, conclusion uh, parts. So first of all, we must address some uh, limitation and maybe uh, try to, um, to to see what can be the biases in our uh, study, but maybe it can be a, a topic of discussion later. Uh, the expected biases in our study is mainly that there could be an over-representation of students with a good internet connection, of course, in the quantitative survey, which had to be conducted online. So of course, students who had poor connection um, couldn't maybe be able to answer uh, our questions. But on the contrary, we expect an over-representation of students meeting difficulties in a qualitative survey. Um, and maybe we can develop on this topic because um, they um, find in the um, discussion with the researcher, maybe some possibility to tell these difficulties. So we're more eager to answer this qualitative survey. So the question will be if there is an over and or under estimation of material difficulties or specific difficulties in our study. So if we want to sum up uh, the results in three main points, we can say that um, most students, as we have seen, return to their parental home in a period of crisis. But of course, we can see that there, are, there is social inequality in this emergency mobility that occurred after the lockdown. Uh, second main result, the housing situation proves to be significantly correlated with psychological distress, even after controlling for social and economic characteristics. So this is consistent with our second hypothesis in the model. And third result, uh, we find that there is a significant effect of housing situation on academic success. Part of it is mediated through psychological success. Uh, distress, sorry, this is a mistake, psychological distress. This is consistent with our third hypothesis. And also there is a, a remaining uh, and residual effect even of housing situation, even after controlling with social characteristics and as well psychological distress again, which is consistent with our fourth hypothesis. 
And to conclude the conclusion, um, our paper contributes uh, in deepening our, our general understanding on, on how students uh, have been affected by the uh, ongoing and still ongoing COVID-19 pandemic and uh, in expanding um, this uh, specific literature. Uh, we have observed that family mostly acted as a shelter um, with, uh, I mean, as it was shown, uh, the living conditions were greater uh, for students who went back to live with their parents. Financially as well for students uh, who started the year in uh, the um, uh, student social uh, hold of residence, they got reimbursed of their rent if they went back uh, to is evacuated uh, the accommodation, so if they went back to their family. Socially, of course, having more interactions uh, with the family was very important and mentally not being alone, the feeling of loneliness that some students experienced by especially those living alone at the time uh, was very important. So the family really uh, acted as a, as a shelter, as a safe place. Of course, on the contrary, uh, students who stayed in the hold of residence, whether it was their choice or whether it was uh, a constraint, uh, was a great source of distress for students. Um, the fact of staying alone, not being able to interact, uh, because some students stay in the same uh, hold of residence, but they were forbidden to uh, to meet each other, to go outside, to uh, to to be in the in a playroom, for instance. So uh, those staying as well in the, in private uh, rented flats. Uh, also felt uh, the the toll of this uh, COVID-19 pandemic. Um, what we also uh, curious about is the long lasting effect of the lockdown uh, three years uh, after the first lockdown started and actually the first lockdown lockdown ended uh, almost, uh, we can still see and uh, still wonder about how students were impacted, whether it was the, the introduction of online classes and how it impacted students uh, motivation, uh, also students being more anxious probably uh, than they used to be before the lockdown. So the different experience and this transition into adulthood, uh, especially you went through uh, the lockdown period is also a very important uh, aspect to address. Um, and so finally, uh, suivant. You can find a publication at the bottom of the of this page of this slide. Uh, so uh, you, we are very happy that this paper was published. And again, we would like to thank uh, Christina and Marcus for all the help uh, provided during this process. And we'll be happy to share it with you. We have uh, e-prints if you are uh, wondering and cannot access the journal, for instance. Thank you very much for listening to us. And uh, please feel free if you have any questions. Thank you so much. Thank you, Alexis, Odile, and Elise. It was a really, really nice presentation. Uh, I really liked the slides, the simplicity. It was very clear and, and very, very intriguing. Uh, anyway, I will open the floor for questions and comments. So please feel free to ask either in the chat or you can also join in with your own video and audio. Or maybe some comments from other countries, so what you have. Uh, noticed or researched uh, about the same topic uh, in your country. It would be also very interesting to hear. Yes, Christina, please. You raised the hand. Uh, you can ask or comment at the moment. We can't hear you. Okay, maybe there are some technical issues. Anyways, uh, I will ask something myself um, until our participants are, are thinking about their questions and comments. Um, you mentioned that you expected to have over-representation of, uh, of students with good connection uh, in the quantitative survey because it was a web survey. But I would like to know, uh, how did you manage to organize the the research uh, during the lockdown period? Were there any special challenges due to the circumstances? Uh, I think I can uh, talk for the uh, qualitative um, part. 
Um, and maybe Odile or Elise will address the uh, quantitative part. Um, obviously, you also need a, a good internet connection um, for the qualitative survey because all the uh, all the interviews were uh, conducted online. Um, yes, you obviously had to adapt because every time you had someone different, uh, some of the students actually went back to their parents. And of course, uh, their feeling was a bit um, different than those who stayed, for instance, those who couldn't um, somewhere during internships. So internships had to uh, had to stop. Uh, some had like student uh, jobs as well, so they had to stop everything. Uh, I think what was very um, and maybe important to stress is that uh, I really observe uh, students that were very down with some help from the from the housing providers, but still it was not enough. And I think the lack of social interactions was very, very heavy on students' uh, students' minds. Um, in in some in in some uh, situations, I really had to uh, to call for psychologue or to university representatives because some of students were in in such. Uh, anxiety and uh, psychological distress that uh, they were asking me for help. I was them. I was there to uh, to interview them in the frame of this research, but they really asked me for help on uh, who they can contact uh, to talk to someone or to get some uh, financial help or, or anything like that. So this this was very new and this was very, uh, I mean, personally, that was very, I, I learned a lot and also I was very kind of worried sometimes about the students. I try to keep track after the interviews to make sure they were they were feeling better, for instance. Um, I could tell a few words uh, regarding the quantitative uh, part uh, of this survey. Um, we had to face um, several challenges uh, first. Uh, um, because of the change, the uh, sudden change of the student situation, living and studying conditions, um, we found that we could just adapt quite simply the, the questions to reflect to the period before, but uh, that was um, uh, the first challenge. Uh, then we had uh, trouble collecting responses from the students because at the beginning of our survey, students uh, where I probably as the whole population quite in shock um, with the, the situation. So they didn't take the time to fill in the survey. And after a few weeks, because our field phase is always quite long, about two months and a half, we, um, after a while, students really um, uh, took uh, the time to respond to the survey and more than usually, actually, we had a very good response rate in the end. Um, but of course, uh, we know that um, students had to fill in the questionnaire sometimes with their uh, smartphones, uh, which is not the ideal situation because it's a very long questionnaire. Uh, so uh, um, maybe some of them uh, could not reach the end to the end uh, of the, the survey. That's a possibility. And um, we could not... Uh, have a to totally new survey afterwards either because um, the situation was so sudden we could not uh, create a whole design for it. Uh, so we could just um, ask again and again to quite the same uh, panel of students, uh, actually uh, the, the questions, but they were really, um, uh, they participated quite well. So it was um, good for everyone. Yes, thanks for explaining. Um, <clears throat> Christina also actually wanted to comment before, but uh, she's having some technical issues. So we have her comments uh, comment in the chat. Uh, and she's saying that it's a very great example um, for two reasons. Your study that on one hand, the reg regression analysis allowing to isolate the effects of housing and thus allowing the identification of the effect regardless of the background variables. And it also fits into many topics that are now on our Euro student agenda, for example, mental health, digitalization, and so on. And on the other hand, uh, the combination of qualitative and quantitative data really allows a deeper insight and understanding. So Christina is asking that, uh, do you have any plans to supplement the uh, OVE survey with qualitative data in the future as well? 
maybe Elise, I don't know. Um, would you like to respond, Elise? Or? Yes, yes, this is a, like an ambition we have at the OVA to, to leave at least the possibility for researchers to uh, re-interview students because we collect um, the, the uh, email addresses and contacts of students who are uh, um, who want to be uh, recontact, who agree to be uh, contacted again for other research. But unfortunately, there are few uh, research that use this possibility. Um, and um, student population is a, a specific population which uh, has a, a high mobility. So even when we have uh, the possibility to contact students, the rates, the answer rates are um, low. We we try this possibility to the research with the research we uh, we did with some colleagues about uh, the effect on digital platform on, on student work, and we were not able to contact as many students as we wanted. So I think we have to think of this possibility uh, to better integrate this qualitative data to, uh, uh, to the next survey, because yeah, of course it's a, uh, very rich when we can match the quantitative and qualitative data. What we have done here uh, with Alexi is, uh, is not a, a proper mixed survey, I will say. I don't know, Alexi, if you agree with this because uh, it's not the same sample, but the, the best uh, method, I think, would be to have the same students answering the quantitative survey and answering the follow-up survey to compare what they say in the interview and having all the characteristics. That's all I wanted to say. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Christina is also saying that it's good to know and it's a good idea. But um, Maria also raised her hand. So please, you can ask or comment. Uh, hi, do you hear me? Yes, we can yeah. hear you. Okay, uh, thank you. Thank you very much for the presentation. Uh, I think it's, it's a very interesting uh, research. And I, well, I have a question uh, related to uh, um, information about the characteristics of the residences or the houses because I don't know if what, what you have found has to do with some characteristics of the of the residence of or of the houses in terms of uh, living in a in a bigger house uh, is better for the student or what you have found has to do more with the social relations like living with some uh, with other people such as the family is better for the for the students so if you have control for the like the characteristics of the houses or of the residence in terms of a square um, a squ uh, meter meters quadrados square meters or meter squares I, I don't know how you say it like if if it's, it's, it's if it's big or small the, the place where you are living or if has um, a place like a, a kind of garden in uh, where you can walk or something so if you have have those those kinds of characteristics in order to to know if it's uh, uh, social relations or, or the space, what matters. Thank you. Thank you for the question. Uh, who will be answering? Uh, Elise, Odile, Alexis? Um, Odile, do you, do you know yes. Yeah. Uh, maybe we can um, do it uh, together. Um, we had only a few more uh, information regarding the um, uh, different aspects of the accommodation. We have a slide, if I can find a way to go back. Um, we have... Uh, this is it. Um, we have the, the size of the accommodation. We asked in the survey, in our main survey, we asked the students about the private uh, part dedicated the, they can use in, a, in an accommodation. If they live alone, it's the whole place, but if they are living in a shared accommodation, um, we ask about their, the, their private areas. Um, and um, in the, the survey we run 
during the lockdown, we also, um, oh, I'm not sure now, but no, I think we didn't have uh, any more questions about this. Um, we focused more actually on who they were living with uh, than uh, where, besides the other aspects we already discussed as uh, so, uh, very uh, fo focused on the studying conditions, um, a desk, uh, private area, calm area to work, uh, the internet connection because of all the remote courses uh, they had to take. Um, we, I think we didn't have more, really more on the subject, but that would be interesting. In our main survey, we have more information, but since they switched, then we lost actually many of the information. I don't know if it is you want to add something. Yeah, no, I, unfortunately, we have a lot of information on this uh, main survey, but uh, we had to, to conduct a very short survey for the follow up because we want to have many students who answer it. So we couldn't like do the, the main survey is like 45 minutes for it's very long for students. And we contacted again two months later to, so we wanted to make a short survey. So we had to make, to make choices. And I believe we asked about the garden or deal, but not to the, yeah. to the whole population of students. We made a mistake. Yes, uh, exactly. We asked uh, only for those who change uh, their uh, accommodation. So we couldn't use this variable. And this was uh, like, yeah, we were a little disappointed not to use this variable because it was only part of the sample. But of course, it has been a, a huge topic having or not a garden during the, um, the lockdown. And uh, we wish we could have, have this information. But at the end, we, we don't know really if it's the links with the family or the fact we just can control with the variables we've shown, as uh, Odile said, like the having a calm space to study, a good internet connection and a personal computer. That's all we know about uh, the housing condition. Um, that's all. Okay, any other questions or comments? Um, maybe to wrap up soon, I will have then another uh, question. You mentioned in the end of your presentation that um, there is a long lasting effect. Um, and uh, I was wondering if you have observed the long lasting effects as well. Uh, are you like um, still working on this question, doing some further research or Maybe you can uh, explain about it as well. Um, we, um, I, I think my colleagues will, uh, will have um, many other details to, uh, to share. Uh, at, um, at the observatory, we, we run another survey one year later one, in uh, 2021, um, uh, late in the spring, we run almost the same survey as the follow-up survey we had run uh, after the first lockdown. And um, this um, survey showed that the, um, the question of the mental health, but the psychological distress of students um, was really, um, um, I don't know, <laughs> a question to, to focus on because uh, the, the share of students uh, declaring uh, signs of psychological distress one year after the first lockdown had already uh, still improved, um, increase, sorry, increase. Um, we don't have exactly the same scope uh, because of technical um, uh, problems to interview, the, to um, uh, survey the students. Uh, we don't have exactly the same scope one year later, but uh, if we use comparable scopes, we had 30% of students um, showing signs of psychological distress in 2020 after the first lockdown. And it um, um, went up to 43% uh, one year later. So we are running our main uh, usual survey. Right, We are really looking forward, uh, forward for the next um, uh, results. Definitely, very interesting. Uh, yes, Alexis, you wanted to comment? 
Uh, yeah, I'm um, just to to add a bit more on the long lasting effects. Um, in, in my case, I'm currently uh, conducting a research on uh, eco anxiety among students, uh, and I just realized uh, when while I was conducting this research that for the the young generation, it's probably an aggregation of so many issues and problematics that. Probably the lockdown sparked as well, you know, maybe the lockdown triggered uh, more vulnerabilities and fragilities among students, but uh, coupled that with, uh, you know, socioeconomic crisis, uh, wars around the world and uh, climate crisis, um, it, it has a lot of effects on, on students and on mental health, and I can observe that. Uh, especially as a as a teacher, I have seen uh, more and more students who are willing to share and uh, talk to uh, professors after classes because uh, sometimes discussing private things may also need uh, to have somebody to talk to. Uh, things I haven't noticed before the lockdown necessarily, so maybe my approach as well has changed. Maybe I may I may have more empathy than I used to have, but uh, really it's a uh, yeah it's uh, something I observe through uh, teaching activities, but as well uh, through research. Very nice to hear. I hope that we will hear about your further research then in the future as well, and maybe at your student talks as well. Anytime. Uh, yeah, it was a pleasure to have you here. Uh, if we don't have any other questions or comments, uh, I think that we can wrap it up for today. Uh, I was very happy to have you here. Uh, thanks uh, to you, Alexis, Elise, and Odile, and also, of course, to our listeners. Uh, our next webinar will take place on the 15th of June, still at the same time, 11 CET. And it will be, again, actually about uh, the impact of COVID-19 on students' well-being. But in June, we will be talking about uh, the example of Denmark. So you can mark the date already in your calendar and uh, we will uh, share the information as the date comes closer. So thank you once again and uh, have a nice day. Thank you, Marlene. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much.